Here we have a prime number p, defined by this expression involving two natural numbers, a and b. We want to find the largest possible value of p. Now, this might look intimidating at first glance, but as we'll see, the rigid constraints of number theory will force some beautiful structure to emerge. And stick around until the end. I've got a completely different approach using rational parameterization that connects this problem to Pythagorean triples in a way that'll blow your mind. Our first move is to wrestle this equation into something more manageable. That square root is what's making things messy, so let's see if we can get rid of it entirely. Starting with our equation here, for this square root to make sense, we need 2a minus b to be non-negative, which means b can't be bigger than 2a. The classic move when you see a square root square both sides. It's simple, but it'll open up the structure we need to see. And just like that, the square root disappears. Working out that square gives us b squared over 16. Now, fractions are annoying when you're thinking about integers, so let's clear these denominators. First, this 16. Multiply both sides by 16. And now let's deal with this remaining fraction. Multiply by 2a plus b, and we get this polynomial equation, much better. Now we're working with integers, which means we can use the tools of number theory. Now I want to solve for a in terms of the other variables. This will help us see what constraints we're really dealing with. Starting from this equation, let's expand everything out. Distributing gives us 32ap squared plus 16bp squared on the left and 2ab squared minus b cubed on the right. I want to collect all the terms with a on one side, everything else on the other. Rearranging like this sets us up nicely for factoring. On the left, we can factor out 2a. Nice and clean on the left. And on the right, we can pull out b. Look at that. Factoring reveals some nice structure. To isolate a, we divide by this quantity b squared minus 16p squared. This is the key expression we need to understand. Since a has to be a positive integer, this whole right side must evaluate to a positive integer. This is where number theory starts to bite. We need this expression to give us a positive even integer. First constraint, for this to be positive, the denominator has to be positive. That means b squared is bigger than 16p squared, so b is bigger than 4p. For 2a to be an integer, this denominator has to divide the numerator. Let me rewrite this to make the divisibility clearer. Splitting the fraction like this separates out the integer part. Perfect. This makes the crystal clear that b squared minus 16p squared has to divide 32p squared b. Now here's where the primality of p becomes crucial. This divisibility condition splits naturally into two cases. Either p divides b or it doesn't. Let's tackle case one first. If p divides b, then we can write b equals k times p for some integer k, since b is bigger than 4p. We need k to be at least 5. After substituting into simplifying, we get this expression for a over p. Now, let's say this fraction reduces to n over d in lowest terms. Since p is prime, the denominator d can only be one or a prime number itself. This severely limits our options. When k equals 5, we get a denominator of 18 in reduced form. But 18 isn't prime and it's not 1, so this case is impossible. When k equals 6, the denominator becomes 5. 5 is prime, so this works. We get p equals 5. When k equals 8, we get 3 in the denominator. 3 is prime, giving us p equals 3. And when k equals 12, the denominator is 2. 2 is prime, so p equals 2 works too. But do we need to keep checking? Here's the key insight. This function has a minimum around k equals 8.2, then increases for k greater than or equal to 9. Since we've already found solutions at k equals 6, 8, and 12, and the function grows for larger k, 
it becomes impossible to get these small prime denominators we need. For completeness, we need to rule out case 2 entirely. Back to our divisibility condition but now assuming P doesn't divide B. If P doesn't divide B, then B squared minus 16P squared must be coprime to P squared. They can't share any factors involving P. So by Euclid's lemma, it has to divide what's left, 32B. Since B is bigger than 4P, let's write B as 4P plus T for some positive integer T. Substituting gives us T times 8P plus T. So T times 8P plus T has to divide 32 times 4P plus T. Since everything's positive, the thing doing the dividing can't be bigger than what it's dividing. This gives us a useful inequality. Now let's see what happens when t gets large, say 16 or bigger. When t is 16 or bigger, the left side becomes at least 128p plus 256, but that's way bigger than what it's supposed to divide, which creates a contradiction. So t can only be 1 through 15. You can check each case by hand and none of them work. Case 2 is impossible. Let me show you just one example to see how this works. When t equals 1, we need 8p plus 1 to divide 32 times 4p plus 1. With a bit of modular arithmetic, this reduces to saying 8p plus 1 must divide 28. But the only divisors of 28 are pretty small numbers and none of them give us a prime value for p. When you check all 15 possible values of t the same way, you'll find that none work. Case 2 really is impossible. And there you have it. Case 1 gives us exactly three solutions. Case 2 is impossible. The constraints of number theory have spoken. Just three little primes emerge from this seemingly complex equation. It's beautiful how restrictive the integer constraints become. So our final answer, the largest prime is 5. But here's where things get really interesting. Remember that completely different approach I mentioned? Let's dive into it. Now, for those of you who are curious, there's actually a completely different way to approach this problem using rational parameterization. This method connects to the theory of rational points on conic sections. Starting with our original equation, the key insight is that for p to be rational, the expression under the square root must be a perfect square of some rational number. Let's say this ratio equals k squared, where k is some rational number. This is the foundation of our parameterization. Now we can work with this algebraically. Cross multiply to clear the fraction. Cross multiplying gives us this equation. Distribute k squared on the right side. Now let's collect all terms with a on one side and all terms with b on the other. Rearranging terms. Factor out common terms. Beautiful, we've separated the variables completely. Notice the structure here. 1 minus k squared on the left, 1 plus k squared on the right. This is the key to the parameterization. Dividing gives us the ratio of 2a to b in terms of our parameter k. Now, here's the crucial step. Since a and b are integers, we need this rational function to produce integer values. Let k equal m over n in lowest terms, where m and n are coprime integers. Substitute our rational form. Clear denominators by multiplying top and bottom by n squared. Now we have everything in terms of integers factorial. This formula should remind you of the parameterization of Pythagorean triples. For this to give us integer values of a and b, we need specific relationships between m and n. From this ratio, we can express a and b in terms of m and n where t is some positive integer scaling factor. This parameterizes all possible integer solutions. Now let's substitute back into our original equation for p. Substitute our expression for b. Multiply both sides by 4n to clear the fraction. This is our key Diophantine equation. For p to be prime, we need very specific values of m, n, and t. The prime factorization on both sides must match exactly. Let's verify with an example. 
When m equals 1, n equals 3, and t equals 3, we can check our Diophantine equation. 4 times 3 times p equals 3 times 1 times 9 minus 1, which gives us 24 equals 24 for p equals 2. Perfect. With a equals 15 and b equals 24, we get p equals 2 exactly. This confirms our parameterization works beautifully. When you work through all the Diophantine constraints systematically, this alternative approach yields exactly the same three prime solutions we found before. It's a beautiful example of how different mathematical perspectives can illuminate the same underlying structure. Thanks for sticking with me through this number theory adventure. If you enjoyed seeing how these constraints forced such a clean answer, consider subscribing for more mathematical explorations. And as always, thanks for watching.